Welcome to worship at Zion today. Um, just a few announcements that I'd like to make at this time, but um, first I'll ask our ushers to wait upon us for our morning offering. Thank you. Let's see, um, is someone to make an announcement? Eric, were you gonna make an announcement? Okay, yep. Good morning, I am Eric Berquist, and I am one of 11 youths and seven adults from Zion attending the ELCA Youth Gathering this July in New Orleans. This Wednesday is the start of the Lenten season, with it being Ash Wednesday, the theme of the Lenten service from Pastor Keith will be lessons for today's disciples. Pastor will be sharing the many ways of sharing and spreading God's word, kind of like what we will be doing in New Orleans. Not only learning more about God's word, but sharing and spreading it in many ways. The youth attending New Orleans are kicking off the Wednesday night Lenten meals by serving a congreg congregational favorite. Cream turkey over biscuits, peas, carrots, jello salad, pickles, bars, and drinks. We have appreciated your support during the past year as we have strived to attain the financial goal for everyone attending the gathering. We will again appreciate your support during the, this delicious dinner. Secondly, next Sunday, February 26, is Mardi Gras Sunday at Zion. The youth going to New Orleans will be serving all sorts of delicious treats for coffee hour with a Mardi Gras theme complete with decor and beads. Another way of sharing with you what we, you all, the things we will have to endure in New Orleans. We have truly appreciated all your support you have given us. Without all of you, our trip would not be possible. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, yeah, so please join our kids uh, for supper on Wednesday evening. And uh, also our uh, Lenten service series starts this Wednesday evening with the Ash Wednesday service. And that is a, a very solemn time with the imposition of the ashes on the forehead. But it's also a time that we start our conversation uh, about what it means to be a disciple. Uh, today we meet some of the disciples and, and we'll be talking a little bit about that later. Um, we also um, wanted to acknowledge our leaders in our church um, Today, at our earlier service, uh, and I would say even now, our, um, I think I'll just ask you to stand if you are here um, to acknowledge that. But uh, the women from our uh, church have a women's organization, and their leadership committee is Nancy Campbell, Rachel Turkelson, Judy Krause, Carrie Campbell, and their secretary is Karen Eicher, treasurer is Nancy Johnson, uh, their resources person is Judy Albrightson. The person in charge of quilters and kits is Darlene Olson. The area church women's representative is Gloria Bunnell. And uh, the C room coordinator is Carol Hychek. Also um, recognizing our church council members, those who are on the council uh, now are Paul Hoffland, Sarah Wienendahl, Sue Steeny, uh, Sue is here, uh, Brian Bergquist is here as well, uh, Gloria Bunnell, Carol Hychek, and Tom Vandenberg. And new to our Congregation Council is Tim Holdorf, Michelle Jarosh, Larry Kenegendorf, and Nick Ramlow. Um, we uh, take a moment now to pray for our leaders. Thank you, Lord, for uh, calling us together as your people. And as a church, we ask that you would help us to seek out your calling in our lives and that we would be able to follow you where you lead the way. 
We pray your blessing on our leaders and our entire congregation that uh, we would be able to hear your voice and confidently move where you have called us. Amen. Seems to me I had another announcement here. Uh, oh, uh, the first Sunday of March are at this service is uh, we have a group coming in and they call themselves Breaking Chains. And so uh, we're excited about that. It'll be a different style of service than we usually have, but we're looking at um, providing some alternatives for our worship here at Zion. And so if you are interested in being a part of a worship group that, that would lead worship uh, during the second service, um, we would certainly welcome you and look forward to uh, that day when, when we will meet with them and they will actually give us a little food for thought. Uh, so we receive our offering at this time. Thank you. I see some, uh, some colored chicks in there too. That's very good. Today is the last Sunday for our, our chick coloring. So uh, uh, we thank you. There's got to be about 100 of them out in the hallway. And, uh, and that has been uh, something to help raise awareness about global hunger, but also to raise some funds. We passed the, uh, the hunger jar two Sundays ago, and it was some over $360 of loose change in that jar. And we've had 15 people so far who have said they would match up to $50. So uh, the donations for World Hunger from what our kids started here a couple of weeks ago is, is well over $1,000. So um, thank you, congregation, family, and friends. Uh, it's, it's good that we can reach out to people in their times of need. We confess our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. It is printed in your worship folder. Please join me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The first hymn we sing today is number 511, the first three verses of thy strong word, 511. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
next song on this day that we receive the, uh, the bread and the wine, we receive the body and blood of Christ is a day for us to be grateful. And so we sing our songs of thankfulness and praise. Now, hymn number ten, 310. <laughs> printed in the worship folder. Please join me as we pray. Almighty God, the resplendent light of your truth shines from the mountaintop into our hearts. Transfigure us by your beloved Son and illumine the world with your image through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Today, the readings from the scripture, uh, the first is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. In the gospel reading from Mark chapter nine, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. 
Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the Gospel of our Lord. I'd like to invite our kids to come up at this time. I have something I'd like to show you. Okay, this is, this is very mysterious. I can't show you until you get up here. So let's, let's look. Okay. Oh, are you trying to peek? Are you trying to see what it is? Uh-huh. Oh, I'll let you see. But I'm just going to show you this side of it for now. Do you know what this is? A what? A boat? A board. A board. A board. It looks like a board. Do you know what else it could be? What do you think? A mirror. A mirror, maybe so. What else could it be? What do you think? A picture. A picture? Hmm. Let's see. The mystery will be revealed. It is, ta-da! It is a picture. Yeah. Oh, you're the winner! Okay, hopefully we're all winners today, right? I think we are. I think we are. Um, what can you tell me about this picture when you look at it? What do you think? Yeah. The middle, um, the middle one is Jesus. The middle one is Jesus. Yep, I think you're right. What else? What do you think? Were you thinking that too? Yeah, that... And what are all these guys doing? They're eating. Yes, they are. That's very important for us to know that they are eating. They're all sitting at the table. This is a picture. It's called the Last Supper. And it's with Jesus. And do you know who all these guys are? What, do you, what would you call them? God. They're, they're not gods. They work for God, though. Yeah. Yep, there's somebody that works for Jesus. When I say it, I think you'll know. They are disciples. Oh, yeah, I just read that in the Bible. You just read that in the Bible, huh? Cool, very cool. So uh, the disciples, sometimes they're called the apostles. That is my cross. And see how it, different shapes on that? It shows that. Yeah. See, it's a cross. Very cool. So this is a picture of Jesus and the 12 disciples. And sometimes people call them the apostles. Have you heard that word too? Nope, not that one. Disciples works for you, huh? Good. So now, and there are 12 of them here. But what I'm going to tell you is that there are more than 12 disciples. How many disciples are there? No, there's more than that. No, it's a 12, so there has to be more than 12. So there's 12 there, right? And then Jesus is the other 13. one. So 13 counting him. But there's more than this. You know where the other disciples are? Where? Where do you think? Outside, maybe? Do you think they're hiding? No. No, they're not hiding. You know, I know where the disciples are. They're right here. You guys are disciples of Jesus. And so am I. And so is everybody out here. That's what... Feet. Yeah, there you can see Jesus' feet down here under the table. And the only picture you don't see is Jesus dying. Yeah, well, that's kind of sad. It's sad to see Jesus dying. All the blood around his body. Yeah. Well, let's take 
a moment to pray and then to remember that we are his disciples too. Thank you, Jesus, for uh, loving us and for calling us by name. Um, we are grateful that you have given us uh, the, the name of the disciples, that we can follow you and that we can go where you lead the way. Uh, we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. You all may be seated, and I'll see you later. I'm going to put this picture back. Thanks for coming up here. So today we, we acknowledged at the beginning of our service some people who are in positions of leadership in our church. And I think it's important for us to do that, to, to name those names and to say, here are the people. And, and uh, we don't necessarily get into a lot of what our leaders do here, but it's, they're important jobs, I think, and in a lot of respects. And these are people who are from among us. These are people that you have... Uh, have elected or have appointed into these uh, positions of leadership. And they're responsible for a lot of different aspects of life in this church. The, uh, the, the women's officers, our church council, these are people who help to make sure that this church does what a church needs to do. Um, I think what some people think of first is, is handling the church finances and making sure that the building is operable, you know, uh, operatable, which, uh, you know what I'm talking about, that it works, uh, that, that the, the bills are paid, the heat is on, uh, that the doors actually stay on the hinges when we close them. Uh, those are some of the things, but these are people who also are responsible for providing opportunities for us to get together to read God's Word and, and to... Um, hear what God wants us to be doing and to provide some of those opportunities. How do we draw other people closer to God with the lives that we live? So these are some of the responsibilities that our leaders have. Um, that's today. Now I want to go back to last Saturday. None of you were with me uh, last Saturday. I was on my own. I was at a training seminar. And when I say that, I know you're just like, whoa, I've been to training seminars and you just can't, can't wait to get back to the next one. So I was at a training seminar. A young man in our church is a cadet at the Wisconsin Challenge Academy uh, down by Toma. And he asked if I would be his mentor. And I said, I'd be glad to. So last Saturday was training Saturday. And so I went down there for uh, that. And while uh, we were in our training sessions, during one of the sessions, I heard a word that I don't think I have ever heard before. Um, it was during the section about leadership. And uh, I've attended workshops on leadership. And I've read books on leadership and staff development and all of that kind of stuff. And it's good. You know, it all has its place. Um, and, but most experts in there are experts. You know, I mean, people who write books about leadership are experts, right? So they, they have asked people what works and what doesn't work. And way at the top of the list of things of, that do not work is um, I, I think I would call it the authoritarian leader. That's the one who says, this is what you do. I'm telling you to do it now. Get it done. No questions asked. Just do it. All right. <laughs> okay. People might do it, but that kind of leadership is not very effective because it does not involve you know, any conversation. It does not necessarily involve respecting the person. Um, it tends to lower morale. It tends to deteriorate trust. Um, so this Challenge Academy 
is a military-based uh, academy. And I was rather expecting the get in line and march kind of thing. And that's exactly what I saw. When the cadets arrived, they all came, you know, marching in step and they were all in their uniforms and, and everything was done uh, with great speed and great accuracy. And so that worked. But the section on leadership used a term followership. I don't think I've ever heard that before, followership. But when I heard it, it sort of made sense. I thought I could understand what followership is as I was doing that. Um, and, and leading, not by coercion, but leading by showing the way, um, living that way. Uh, when respect is called for, the respect is given first. And, it, and, and when order is called for, order is given first. It's shown in the life of everyone who is a part of that, that uh, academy. And so that leadership is not just bossing people around, not shoving things down anybody's throats, but it is shown by the way life is lived. Um, and I think that we all learn lessons in leadership best by the way life is lived. I am thinking that most of us have learned how to live life by observing our parents. They've shown us ways to live. Um, if they just bossed you around, not maybe the best model, but actually living that life and saying this is the way we do it, that works the best. And I'm thinking that if we do the same thing for our own children, saying this is the way you treat people and then you treat them that way as well, that's the best way to learn. This is the way we live life and you model that life. That is, I think, followership. It is living the way before uh, you. And so it strikes me that this is what's happening in this Bible reading from the Gospel of Mark. This is Transfiguration Sunday. And we don't really know a lot about transfiguration except that everything in this story is transfigured. Everything is changed from one thing into another thing. Jesus is changed. Um, the whole scene on the mountain is changed. Um, two people show up in this picture. Moses and Elijah had been dead and gone for centuries. How do you figure that out? How do you explain that to somebody that people centuries dead have been in your presence and you wanted to actually build them a house? <laughs> I, I don't know what to say, the disciples were saying. I don't know what to do. Everything changed. Even the disciples' lives changed that day because of what happened there. But as they're on their way back off of this mountain of transfiguration where everything changed, Jesus says to them, now you can't say a word of this to anybody. Don't tell anyone what happened. So maybe we suspect living the life of a Christian that Jesus does want us to tell people about him. And here he's saying, disciples, don't say a word. Not yet. Not now. So here where everything changes, nothing is to be said. And I'm thinking some of us, me for sure, is wondering what is the catch here? Why does Jesus expect us to tell others about him, but then he says, but don't say a word? <laughs> I'm, I'm a little confused here, and I get confused easily perhaps, but how are those disciples supposed to bring other people to God if they can't say what they're supposed to say? How do we tell people without telling people? Or is this just a temporary thing? Or is Jesus maybe trying to say something else, like when he told parables? 
He would say, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. And you think, hmm, no, it's not, it's not a mustard seed, but there's something, he's trying to say something else. Is that what's happening here on this mountain of transfiguration? Um, the disciples had been going with Jesus for a little while, and everything had been going really, really well. If you, if you go back even just a few chapters in the Gospel of Mark from where this story is in Mark 9, you see all kinds of miraculous things happening and feeding thousands of people with morsels of food and, and healing people who are sick and, and you know, uh, just other amazing, astounding things are happening. And, and this, is, this is pretty good. <laughs> These guys are kind of liking this. And it's like, wow, everywhere we go, amazing things are happening. Where is this going? The disciples thought it was getting bigger and better. They did think that because just a little while later in this chapter in Mark, the disciples want to know which one of them is going to be at the, in the positions of power in the new Jesus administration. You know, when you see power and you want power, you start scratching the back of the people that are saying, yeah, can you get my back there? Say, yes, oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Whatever you want. <laughs> I'm here for you, you know that, right? The disciples started to ask those kinds of questions. Who's going to sit at your right and left hand when you come into your kingdom, into this position of power? Because they really liked what was happening. They liked where it was taking them. And Jesus told them where it was all going. They didn't expect what he told them. Um, he told them, n not in so many words, but by, I think, what we could call followership. He said, can you be like a little child? Can you lay your whole life before me, and I'll be in charge? Can you um, let go of everything, and can you take up my cross and follow me? Jesus was asking them, can you do what I'm about to do? And of course they said, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll do that. They didn't know what we know. They did not know when Jesus asked this that he would soon be dying on a cross. They did not know what we know. When he was dying on the cross, they all ran in different directions. And it's like, oh, <laughs> enough of this administration. I think I've got other things to do. And they did hide, those disciples, who really, just days before, really wanted to be in charge. When the bad stuff started to happen, they completely backed away. But they didn't know what we know that Jesus would have a new life. And eventually, so would they. They didn't know that at the time. And so can we take up his cross and follow? That's where this followership comes into play. Jesus doesn't just tell us to take up a cross. It's his cross. It's the one he took up first. This leads us to the next thing. You know, the, who were the disciples? I know some people who actually can, can just name off all 12 of the disciples. And I maybe could, I think, I don't know, I didn't try. I think I could do it, but it might take me a while. And, or I might get caught up on some of the details. Like, well, let's see, you now Matthew 
and Levi were the same person. That's not two different people. So, uh, you know, I'm missing, well, Bartholomew. Uh, there's some of the more obscure ones that, you know, then we really start to scratch our heads. But rather than worrying about that, I'm not going to hand out a quiz on the disciples. I'm going to say, look at yourself and consider that you are the disciple that needs to be concerned with what the disciples are going to be doing now. What are you going to do as a disciple of Jesus? And I'm hoping that our Wednesday evening Lenten series on discipleship is going to help us focus on that um, and, and to look at some specific areas of discipleship that, that we will be able to actually do when we, <laughs> when we move forward, that, that it won't be so much about talking, but about doing. The first disciples on that Mount of Transfiguration, I think, had kind of forgotten the, what they really needed to know the most, is that when everything around them was changing, that they were supposed to change too. <laughs> you know, they were not the rock-solid people. They needed to change too. They needed to go where Jesus was leading them. And I can only imagine that the inner beast of the human spirit was just salivating all over this idea of being in charge, being the leader. Because look at all the power that Jesus had and look at all the big things that Jesus was doing. And Jesus when he sees this in his disciples, steps it down for them. A big step. A big step. And he says that as leaders, they need to be servants. As leaders, they need to be followers. He has a way of turning everything around. And the silence. Uh, he told them not to say anything. I, I wonder about that sometimes. What is this about silence? I mean, I'm, I'm the one who just talks, talks, talks all the time, right? I mean, this is what I do. I'm just, <laughs> I'm Mr. Talkative when it comes to talking about faith. And Jesus says, don't say a word. So what am I supposed to do? That's a problem that preachers have. And, and I think it's a problem that a lot of other people have too, thinking, well, I don't know what to say. And so they say, well, well talk to the pastor because he'll know what to say. <laughs> Sometimes words get in the way because what we want to say doesn't always come out the way we want it to come out. And so words are not the best way of living the life of the disciple. Jesus says, live it. We have to be the disciple. We have to do the disciple thing. And I'm hoping that we will be able to, to see that in these weeks to come, these Wednesday evening services, talking about discipleship, talking about servanthood, talking about followership, um, even though the cross lays ahead, and we know it now, that we will believe that it's the cost of discipleship is worth it. What we have to give, God will weigh more than return. Um, to walk that path, to open our minds, sometimes to just stop talking, um, but to model the life of Christ, to live that life of Christ. Jesus said, um, or when, when they were on that mountain, God said to the disciples, listen. Listen to Jesus. Mark 9, verse 7. Listen to Jesus. And in that silence, I think we can begin to lead other people toward Christ. This is followership. This is the life that is well lived. This is giving up ourselves. 
for the sake of Jesus and for the sake of other people. The, the leaders here at church um, do not accept positions of leadership thinking that now they're going to be the bosses around here. And now they're going to tell everybody what to do and get it done. The leaders in our church, I am confident, understand that this is about being the servant of the whole church, being the servant of to the world. That's what we do. And we spend time reading God's word together. We spend time praying together. We spend time talking about our faith with each other. And, and that to me is the best thing we can do, that we get to know each other better as children of God. Um, not just who's got the biggest ideas, but <laughs> how, do we, how do you know God? Help me to know God better too. And I, I think that that is really an exciting thing about what I see happening in our church council and I think what our women's group is trying to accomplish as well, getting to know one another in the context of faith. So we encourage our leaders to take time to read God's word, to listen to Jesus. Like he said, on that mount of transfiguration, that place where everything changed, when we listen to him, that's when our hearts begin to change too. Uh, let's take a moment to pray. Lord, you have shown us the way, and sometimes what we see, it is very difficult. And sometimes what we see, we do not want to give up. But we ask that you would uh, enlighten us with uh, your presence and with your power and with your grace, and to know that the greatest thing we can do is to be the servant uh, where you have led the way. We pray this in your life-giving name, Jesus. Amen. We continue as we receive the greatest gift that Jesus had to offer to us, and that is his life. And so we receive this in the bread and the wine. It is the body and blood of Christ given and shed for us for the forgiveness of all of our sins. And so we hear these words from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And we pray our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Holy Communion is prepared. Uh, our servers, please come forward.
Gracious Lord, we thank you for this time that we have together to hear your word and to sing your praise. We ask that you would instill in us a spirit of servanthood, that we would be able to go where you lead the way, that we could be followers, and that in that followership, we would be able to lead others toward you. We trust that your spirit works through us and in ways that we cannot even understand, but we place that in your care and uh, trust that, that all that we give to you will be, uh, will be of benefit to those who receive and will give you glory. We take a moment for silent prayer. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We go in peace to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our final song, one of those shining songs, Shine Jesus Shine, number 671. and mercy say